It's a joy to be here this morning with you. I'm thankful for this fellowship, and I'm thankful for everyone participating online um, who are joining us from various locations around the world. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters around the state. It's always a, a thrill to get to connect to the congregations throughout Alaska, and it's also really good to be home, to be here with you today. Before we get into, today, into today's lesson, um, I find it necessary for us to look at a passage together. If you would turn with me to Psalm 91, verses 1 through 6, we're going to read this. COVID is something that's been a part of our life for a year and a half now. And it's so a part of our culture and ways, it's in the news all the time. And I want us to read this passage in Psalm 91 because it puts things in perspective, I think, exactly where things need to be. Psalm 91, 1 through 6. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Listen to this. And from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by the day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. There is a disease going around, there's this virus, it does exist, and how we have to interact with it requires a lot of wisdom depending on our families, our jobs, our travels. It affects the way we live in a lot of different ways, but one way it should not affect us is fear. As God's people, we are in the shelter of the Almighty, and we need to pray for wisdom and how to move forward, how to act, what's the proper way to navigate through this. But one thing we cannot afford to have is fear. And so before we get into today's lesson, which is about fasting, about having the heart of God in our hearts, I wanted us to look at this passage because there's some of us right now that have COVID. There's some of us that are having a quarantine because of COVID. There's some of us who have been traveling and had to jump through certain hoops because of COVID. And it's just a lot of ripples coming out from this pestilence, this, this thing that's in this world at this moment. And as God's people, we need to walk by faith and not by fear and make sure that that is a spirit we never compromise, that we recognize that God is in control and that our circumstances around us, there's going to be times where there is something stalking in the darkness. There is a real threat. There is something that is dangerous, but because of God and his trustworthiness, we don't have to fear. And so I want us to make sure that we're walking by faith and not by fear. We want to have God's heart and not anyone else's. So, Let's now go back to Matthew. We're going to look, continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason why is because we're looking at, we want to be God's people. We want to be disciples he calls us to be. And so we're going back to the fundamentals. We're looking at what Jesus' uh, first real public teaching of what he's looking for, for those to be light of the world, to be salt of the earth. And we want to be his church, not somebody else's. So we're looking at his fundamental teachings. And one of the first things he teaches his disciples is this concept of fasting. So Jason read for us here, Matthew 6, 16 through 18. We'll read it again here. This is in the English Standard Version. Jesus says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So fasting is not, I want to be clear, fasting is not just the mere abstaining from food, and it's also not for something other people to see. It's about 
we're going to see that it's personally doing whatever it takes to have the heart of God. And it's not something that's to cause other people to pat you on the back or applaud your spirituality. It's something that's private. It's something that is between you and the Lord. I saw years ago this commercial about this uh, tobacco company that had donated a million dollars to a charity. And then it came out a few weeks later that that tobacco company who made this commercial about them donating this million dollars to this charity spent eight million dollars advertising their one million dollars of donating to a charity. And every time I read this passage, I think of that scenario where they're doing something that people recognize as a good thing and is in itself a good thing, but then how they spend so much more letting people know that they had done this positive, virtuous thing. And so in testing our spirits, looking at what, what's the motivation behind our actions, we are not to be doing good to be gaining just a reputation from other people. I think of Revelation 3, 1, ever since we went through the seven churches in, in Revelation, and looking at Sardis, Sardis in chapter 3, verse 1, where Jesus says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. And that that challenges me so much because it's pretty easy to get applause and a pat on the back from people, from society, to have to be acceptable to, to people. But that does not mean that you're right with God. And making sure that the motivation, the standard, the goal that we have is not just to be acceptable by the world or by others, but that we're the people God wants us to be, that we're followers of him, that we're looking to have his will in our hearts and not just to meet the standards of people around us. And so the Jews at this time, they were looking to have a reputation that was admirable and spiritual by other people. And that is not what God's looking for. God's looking for us to be right with him, not to be right in our own eyes or to be right in the eyes of others. It's about what's going on on the inside. And that's really the consistent theme of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is examining the heart and wanting to make sure that the spirit of people is correct, not just specific actions that that people do at specific times. He talks here about this reward, that God will reward those who fast in the way that he wants us to fast. And we're going to look at what this reward is. We're going to see, we're going to go back to Isaiah and see the fast that God is looking for. And we're going to see that the reward is God is going to give us himself. There's no greater reward than him and being in his presence, having his heart as our heart. There's no greater reward than this. So let's go over to Isaiah 58. We're going to read verses 6 to 12. And we're going to look at the fast that God desires. Verses, let's start in verse 6. This is God speaking. He says, Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? I always get really excited in Scripture where I, when God specifically lays out what he likes or what he's looking for or what his will is. Anytime it's in there, I always make certain to highlight it to make sure that you remember where this is at because it's essential for us to know what does God want. And we don't want his will just up for our interpretation. We want to hear him say and him declare what he's looking for. And for us to have confidence and say, not my will be done, but yours be done, we actually know what his will is. And so here we see this is the fast that he's choosing. This is what God is looking for. And I just find that to be very encouraging and awesome for him to lay it out. This is what he wants. And here he shows us this idea of loosening the bonds of wickedness, undoing the straps of the yoke, letting the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. And it's this idea of creating an environment for people to thrive. As, as a man and as a husband and as a father, there's so much more to providing for people, providing for my family, than just putting food on the table. But 
providing a, an environment, a quality of life for my family and for people around me, for them to thrive, to recognize what their needs are, and try to help create an environment for them to reach their full potential. I think it's that type of spirit that we're, is being spoken of here, that we, in our actions and interactions with other people, we're helping create an environment for people to thrive and not to control, not to oppress, but we're rather to create environments that are optimal for people's growth around us. So we're going to continue in this passage in Isaiah 58. The next portion here says, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? And when you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Something my dad taught me when I was very young was that God always gives you enough to be generous. doesn't matter what it is, whether it's your physical strength, whether it's the money you have in your account, or whether it's the time that you have, it's the abilities you have. No matter what it is, if God's given you something, you have enough of it to share with other people. And so here, there's so much uh, personal focus here, and I hope you caught it, that it's your bread, it's your house, it's things you see, and it's your flesh, meaning your own, your own people. And God is looking for us to share, to be generous with the things that he has given us. Now, some people I've heard over the years talk about how God's design for things is like a form of, of communism or socialism, where everybody is just you know, sharing everything, and we have everything in common, there's no needs, and we sell our things, and everyone's just like this communal possession. And the big difference is communism says that what is yours is mine, where what God says is, and Christianity shows, is what's mine is yours. And it's this free act of generosity to those around us. And so what God has given you, he calls you to be generous. He calls me to be generous. And to what extent that generosity looks like, that's between you and the Lord. That's not something that you can mandate or you can put a percentage to, but God has given us enough to be generous. We're called to be generous with the things that he's given us. And this idea I want to make a point of, hide yourself from your own flesh, is this was talking about the Israelites in Isaiah and for the Jews not to hide themselves from their fellow man, but to recognize that they're part of the same people. And when we look at humanity, we sometimes dehumanize those that we are opposed to or we have different ideas or beliefs and we can consider them less than human and what is required of us is to recognize that we are of the same, we're cut from the same cloth, that we're all made in the image of God. Every human being on this planet Jesus died for because they're our fellow man, our fellow human. And so we should not hide ourselves. We're not to, to distance ourselves and dehumanize the people that are perhaps different from us or those that um, we're even opposed to. So God has given us enough to be generous. Let's go now to the verse 8. Then, once we've done these things... Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. So this first word, then, once we've created an environment for people to thrive, once we're being generous with the things God has given us, then something has changed. There's now a cause and effect, and we're looking at the effect now, and it is pretty awesome. The first thing we see is your light shall break forth like the dawn. There's going to be a shining out. There's going to be something that's on display that wasn't there before. And this is like what Jesus is saying earlier in Matthew 5 with being a light to the world and a salt to the earth is when you are having the heart of God, there is now light in this world that wasn't there before and it shines out. And then from there, there's healing that takes place. I love that it says it springs up speedily. This is, this is quick welling up of, of healing that's taking place on the inside. I, I don't know where I got the idea, but I'm, it's, it's pretty bogus, and I'm starting to step away from it more, is that 
when you look at someone's growth and healing spiritually, we tend to to think of someone going from lost to saved and like where they're discipled, they repent, they, be, they get baptized, they, re, they have their sins washed away, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and they, they go from death to life and it's this huge transformation and then for the rest of their life it's just like this slow drip of, of growth and it's just this real gradual walk of faith that over you know 80 years there's just been this this slow drip of this cup getting a little more full as we're just from one degree of glory to another becoming more and more like Jesus. And it's just this very, 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 very gradual marathon that is the, and in a lot of ways it is a long journey, not a sprint. But I read these words here, of this healing springing up speedily. And I'm looking back over my life and people I really look up to and, and, uh, and admire and there's moments in someone's life where they're tested or they're encouraged or they're rebuked or they're pruned or they're disciplined and God causes healing to take place inside of them spiritually where they had some sort of thorn, they had some sort of burden, they had something that they had been wrestling with for who knows how long and then that's repented of or that's changed and God causes growth to happen to think that we just have this big spike of spiritual growth when we're converted and then it's just this slow progression afterwards instead of recognizing that God doesn't have a limit to the amount of growth and healing he can do. He doesn't max out in his ability to heal and to, and to change at our conversion. But throughout every day, we are five seconds away from growing the most we've ever grown. Like the, we, there's so much freedom, so much power, so much hope as his people to box him into like, well, I only really changed when I converted and now I'm just kind of hanging on. There's healing that can spring up speedily when we have the heart of God. And that is extraordinarily inspiring to know that we are five seconds away from being healed from growing more than we've ever grown before. How much more like the heart of God can you have? I know I still have a lot of room to grow, and that's an exciting thought. I want to continue to grow. I want to continue to be changed. I want to be, there's things I need healing from, and I want healing, and he's the great physician. He's not done with me yet. He's not just filling in the little cracks that are left over. I got a lot of room to grow. I want a lot more fruit coming from my life. And that's what Jesus is all about. So let him heal you. Let him, and I'm praying for him to continue to heal me. And it, and it might be a slow, gradual process for the rest of your life. But that's not for you and I to decide. If he wants us to grow, if he wants to heal us, let that happen. Don't quench what he is doing inside of you. Okay, your righteousness shall go before you. So when you have the heart of God, the right path, right standing with God is going to be in front of you. I think of Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, trusting in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. When we have his heart, when we're, when we're trusting in him, our paths are made clear and we have this, the right way in front of us. He makes our path straight. And then this idea at the end of this passage, the glory of the Lord will be a rear guard, is such a powerful image where God is protecting you and he's right behind you. I love looking at the spiritual dynamics throughout scripture and Satan starting in the garden and then his track record and, and his journey throughout the scriptures and you see him in the New Testament, in the, walk, in the times of Jesus' physical ministry, and then you see him after the cross, and you, it's just so fascinating seeing his losing streak of things. And one thing in particular is in James, you see that we can resist the devil and he will flee from us. Well, it didn't always used to be that way, where he would possess and dominate, and he had all the kingdoms of the whole world at his disposal, it seemed, and but now he flees from us, and it's like, I mean, well, what's he running from? Well, for those who are in Christ, he's running from the one 
in whose presence we stand in now. Because we draw near to God, and he can draw near to us, and that's what Satan flees from. He doesn't flee from Mike. There's some really funny passages in Scripture about people trying to just invoke the name of the Lord without actually being his people, and that's a story from another time. Um, but it results in some beatings and seven guys running away naked. It's a really funny story in Scripture. It's another time. Some of you will know what it's all about. I did some comics of it, too. It's really great. Anyways, we have the glory of the Lord as our rear guard. When we stand in the presence of the king, that is what our enemies also see. And it is so powerful. It's the right place to be. And Satan flees from us because he looks at us and he sees in whose presence we stand in. And it is the safest place to be, having God Almighty being right behind you. I look at Ephesians 6 and I look at the armor of God, this figurative analogy of this equipment God has given us and it's this itemized gifts from God that we have and one thing that's not covered is our backs we have this breastplate of righteousness but there's no back plate you know of, of some kind and I think that's ironic because Christians as his people uh, we don't have to run from evil. We can, with God in our back, we can have confidence in knowing that nothing's going to attack us from behind when we're sober-minded and watchful, because God has our back. And with when God's for us, who can be against us? So now let's continue now to verse uh, verse nine. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall call, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and the speaking of wickedness. So now we continue this more idea of this then, when we're doing the things that God wants us to do, when we're treating people the way he wants us to treat them, there's this effect that takes place, and it's this further connection to God, where you will call out to God, and he will say, here I am, that God will answer us. And again, we see this, this yoke, this binding, this controlling. It makes me think of Hebrews 12, 1, where we're told to lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and run this race with endurance. There's things in our life as Christians that are continuing to bog us down, that their weights, there's things that have been so familiar, they've been a part of our lives for so long, they almost seem to be a part of us. Different habits, different behaviors, different memories, regrets. There's things that are like a plant that has branches that are not producing fruit. They're taking energy from these other branches that should be bearing more fruit. So they're in need of pruning, of removal. We're to lay aside, we're to let these things go. Let God remove them so that we can um, be able to call on his name, to be more focused on him. And again, that's what fasting is all about, doing whatever it takes to get more in line with the heart of God. And that can take lots of different shapes for different people because we're all very different people. But this pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness I want to talk about. The pointing of the finger, the, we first see it in the garden. When you have Adam and Eve pointing the finger where... Eve is saying, the serpent deceived me. And Adam saying, this woman that you made. And there's this, this pointing of the finger blaming others for the actions of the individual. And that type of behavior is not the heart of God. And it's something that humanity has struggled with from the very first falling until now. And yeah, there's a lot of stumbling blocks that people put into our lives there's a lot of things that our culture and society and families and friends and ministers and people can do to us that can make life more difficult. The pointing of the finger is not the solution. And there is a need for us to take personal responsibility for our own actions and not to be blaming others for how we think or what we feel. The only one that can control you is you. And that is an essential thing to recognize is that the pointing of the finger does not solve any of your problems or others. And then further along that line of thinking is this idea of speaking wickedness. Now, wickedness is a very fascinating topic. And when I initially think of wickedness, I think of 
you know, the occult, I think of sorcery and magic, and I think of just real, just evil, just, you know, hidden things with malevolent intent and just wickedness. And I read Matthew 25, parable of the talents, and you look at the one talent servant who didn't trust the master and feared, and he buries and hides what his master gave him, and his master rebukes him saying, you wicked and slothful servant. And we see that wickedness is not having the will of God. It is not trusting what God has said, that that is wickedness, which paints a very different light than like summoning demons or something really you know, bizarre and blatantly evil. Wickedness is not having God's heart. And that can take a lot of different forms. It's like how many wrong answers are there to a fill-in-the-blank question? If it's not the truth, then it's a lie. And that type of lying, all lies, is this form of wickedness because it's not truth, it's not the heart of God. So speaking wickedness, there's a lot of things you could say that are untrue. There's a lot of things I could say that are untrue. And if we're saying things that aren't based in truth, it's wicked. So this is a time for us to examine ourselves of what's coming out of our mouths because it's what comes out of a man that defiles them. Are the things coming out of your mouth things that are true? Or are there things that we're relying on our own understanding? Are they things that the world is saying? Are they things from God? Or are they things from anywhere else? And for us to be having the heart of God, we need to make sure that God's heart's coming out of our mouths and that the things that we're saying are we're speaking the truth in love, that we're trusting God, not anyone or anything else. All right, three more verses in this passage. Now verse 10. <clears throat> if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then, you shall, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday. Can you recognize that this world is hurting? It's a pretty, pretty easy to see that, that this world's pretty bent. This is a fallen world. And the poor, the impoverished will always be here, Jesus teaches. It's pretty clear to see that there's a lot of problems on this planet. But the darker the world gets, the brighter and greater in contrast light stands out. And when you and I as God's people reach out into this world and share love that doesn't come from this world, that stands out. And that's what the world needs to see now more than ever that God's people have something that's not from this world, that we have a love that doesn't come from around here. And that takes place when we reach out to the afflicted, that when we give comfort to those who are in need of it, because we've received something that doesn't come from around here, and that's something we get to be generous with. We love because he first loved us. And we get to live that out in every way, every day, with every person. Now notice here it says, your gloom shall become as noonday. Not just the gloom or others' gloom, but your gloom. Do you have some gloom in your life? You got some things going on that are kind of gloomy? I do. To pretend like that there is no gloom. Yeah, I'm kind of by default an optimist. I'm a very much a silver lining type of guy. And sometimes, unrealistically so. I don't know if you can relate to that or if you know anyone else like me where it's like, everything's fine. Like this building could be on fire and there could be uh, just a horrendous accident going on and I would be like, yeah, things will work out. It's okay. Sometimes things are not okay. And I have to recognize that uh, sometimes there is some real gloom going around me because Jesus even recognizes that. He weeps at Lazarus' funeral, he weeps over Jerusalem because the people in the city are not what they're supposed to be. There's some things worth mourning about. There are some, there's some real gloom in this world. And so owning that is really important to face that and to embrace it, that, man, there's some painful, dark things in my life. But because of who God is, he can turn that gloom into the noonday, that God's big enough and strong enough, wise enough, loving enough to take the darkest things in my life and shine the brightest light in the middle of it all. And that's some good news. 
And it's not just burying my head in the sand, pretending like there's no problems anywhere. It's that God's big enough to handle any problem I'm in. And there's, there's so much more freedom and so much more equipping than just like, yeah, everything's fine. No, some things are not fine. It is not fine sometimes. It's not fine that people are hurting or dying or that a country is rebelling or that people are becoming more godless or my loved ones are hurting or that I'm hurting people or there's, there's so many things that are like, that's just not good. That's, that's gloomy. And instead of just ignoring it and pretending like none of that exists, instead of recognizing God can do something about that. And I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to believe that. He can turn this gloom into noonday. We have a hope. Love hopes all things. And we are people of hope. Amen. If there was any group of people on the planet in all human history that had a reason to sing, it's Christians. If there was any, because there's only one hope. To whom else shall we go? Who can solve the gloom? Who can solve the gloom equation? There's only one person. His name's Jesus. And we know him. And we can help others know him. We are people of hope. So now let's continue. Two, ver two left. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desires in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a water garden, like a... Spring, uh, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. He's going to guide you how often? Only on Sundays. Only when Mike's talking to you. you know, when does he say he's going to guide you? Continual. Does God take days off? No. He doesn't call in sick. He's not busy. He can guide us continually. He's way more committed to this than we are. And I'm so comforted that it's not just up to us to sort all this out and figure this out. But he is actively guiding us through his word, through his spirit, that this is not just left to our own devices and hopefully we make it. God is way more committed to this than we are. And there is this healing that takes place on such a deep level. It says he makes our bones strong. You can't really get any more internal than your bones. And so it's proverbial. It doesn't actually like physically make your, like, aha, I'm a Christian. I am now like physically more strong. It's this depth that God is healing us and making us strong on the most fundamental, intimate, and deepest level. God is making us stronger. And what I continue to see in walking with God is that the Lord very rarely reduces the intensity of the storm in our lives, but rather he gives us a more sure footing. That he gives you the strength and the endurance to, to make it through the storm, not just making your circumstances easier. It's through him we can endure all things. It's through Christ that we can endure whatever trials we face because he's greater than the storm. And sometimes I recognize in my prayers, I ask God to make things easier Instead, he's, he's wanting me to become stronger. And so he's making our bones strong, not just making the weights we carry or things we have to go through lighter or more pleasant for us to go through. So he doesn't reduce our difficulty. He increases our strength. He makes our bones strong. And then also I want to highlight here that, uh, like this idea of this watered garden whose springs do not fail, um, that you have been given enough to be awesome. That you have been given enough through God's grace and generosity to, to not fail. You're not going to run out of spirit. God didn't just give you the exact amount to barely make it. He gave us all things pertaining to life and godliness. That's a pretty long list of life and godliness. He's given us every spiritual blessing, not just a portion. He's given us him, his own self, his own son, He's given us enough, more than enough, to thrive. So we have been given us more than sufficient amount. And then our last verse this morning here in Isaiah 58. And your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt, and you shall rise up the, raise up the foundations of many generations. 
You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. There is an original design for each of us where God desires us to be with him forever. That was our, that is humanity's destiny is to live forever with our father. That's the initial design. And in Christ, that is fulfilled where our we were created for good works or his workmanship in Christ. And there's this place prepared for all of us in heaven. And when we have God's heart, it takes place where we are now fulfilling our destiny. It sounds kind of cliche, but it's true. Humanity is designed to be with God forever. And when we have his heart, he causes that to happen. God is big enough and strong enough and wise enough and powerful enough to heal and recreate you, even your very soul, your most fundamental, deepest part of you, God changes and makes new and prepares a place for us. And I love this title, Repairer of the Breach. I mean, what an epic title. I remember reading this for the first time in South Africa and just blew my mind. as like, hello, What's your name? I'm the repairer of the breach. <laughs> it's like, whoa, oh, this is so cool. And because God's equipped us to be his workers and we get to help people and show people that uh, the one who can repair the breach, and I'm not the solution Christ is, but I get to introduce people to Christ, and so do you. And so you get to share what's been given to you. If God has healed you, if he has put his spirit in you, then you get to be a representation of that to the world and invite people to sit at the table you get to sit at. The repair of the breach, restore of streets to dwell in. So next time you're filling out a resume, you can put repairer of the breach on there. It's pretty, pretty good stuff. So in conclusion, fasting is not about merely the abstaining from eating physical food. It's about doing whatever it takes to have the heart of God. And if you need to take time to focus on treating people right, and you need to take time on letting things go in your life, and in doing so, you just forget to eat, well, that's fasting. It's not just about, I'm not going to eat lunch today because I want to be spiritual. It's I got things, I, there's things in my heart that aren't lining up with God, and I'm going to wrestle with that. I'm going to repent of those things, and I'm going to take time and just focus on, make, like Jesus in the, in the garden of praying three times, not my will but yours be done. We go through that. That's all fasting, to have the type of heart he chooses. And when we have the heart he chooses, this whole world changes because we change. So I want us to recognize, like going all the way back to Psalms, that we're going to be people of hope. We're not going to be people of fear. We're going to be people who trust in this God that we all have and that we have access to him through Christ. And that changes how we think. It changes how we live. And it changes what this world sees. And what this world needs to see is the love of God. And you have that in your hearts if you're one of his. And he's given you enough love to be generous with that love. So let's share what we found. Let's let him continue to heal us. Let's repair the breaches in this world through what God has equipped us to do. We've got a lot of work to do. It starts right here. And then from here, it goes out here. So with that in mind, if there's anyone here that's suffering, that needs help in any way, if someone is not a Christian and would like to, um, to, to do so, uh, to choose to follow Christ and be immersed in him, if there's any needs at all, Please come forward while we stand and sing.